OK, so it, was, it is time to go to experiment. And so Bell has shown us that an experimental test is possible. And when Bell's paper was written, there was no experimental result available to be tested against Bell's inequality. And what is surprising is that not only any situation that you can describe with classical physics obeys Bell's inequality, but most of the situation that we think should be described by quantum mechanics also obey Bell's inequality. And actually, what you find is that you must look for a situation, a very specific situation where the test is possible, and this was proposed a few years later by Clauser, Horn, Shimony, and Holt. And now I'm rapidly going to describe what has happened in the experimental domain. There was what I call the pioneers experiment, and the pioneers were Clauser and Friedman in Berkeley, and at the same time, there was an experiment in Harvard, and the first results were contradictory, and a few years later, Fry in Texas did an experiment in which there was a first laser. Signal to noise ratio was better, and he also found quantum mechanics like Clauser. But all these experiments were significantly different from the scheme I have shown you. Then there were the experiments we did in Institute Optique, and I'm going to review them very rapidly. And then there is a third generation experiment on which I will comment somewhat. So the key ingredient in the experiment we started in our say in the last 70 was the development of a source of entangled photon with unprecedented efficiency. The idea was the following. If you excite an atom to an uh, excited level with angular momentum zero, and you let the atom decay through j equal one, and you select a particular axis of propagation for the two photons, then the only possibility to, this, to this excite is either this one or that one, as, as usual in quantum mechanics, when you have two channels open, you must add the amplitudes. And so this is a state that you have here in circular polarization, and you convert to linear polarization, and you have exactly the state you are looking for. And the key ingredient was to be able to excite this with two photon absorption with lasers. It was pretty new at that time, two photon absorption, and we needed to have a dye laser to exactly match the energy difference, etc. A lot of work for young people nowadays is pretty obvious, but at that time it was a real tour de force. And with this, we obtain 100 true coincidence per second, while previous workers had a fraction of a coincidence. So we, had, we won many order of magnitude, which means, for instance, with this rate of coincidence, you get a 1% precision for only 100 seconds of counting. And with this, we did the first experiment consisting of, it was the same scheme, far from the ideal scheme, but what we did is pulling the polarizer far from the source. And the reason was that many theories were telling us, look, entanglement is a property at short distance. It will disappear at large distance. And then I would ask the question, what means large and small? They would say, mm, coherence length of the photon. And here you see 5 nanoseconds means the coherence length of 1.5 meter. So I put it at 6 meter. And entanglement was still there. We still violated Bell's inequality. This was the first achievement. It was still in the old scheme. And then we could make polarization beam splitter, custom made at that time. And with this polarization beam splitter, we could do an experiment in which, for the first time, we had access to the plus one and minus one channels. While in previous experiment, it was not the case. In previous experiment, it was just like a Polaroid. You only have access to the transmitted, but the orthogonal one is absorbed, okay? And it makes the test complicated and not really direct. While here, you measure plus, 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 minus, minus, plus, minus, minus. And so here, the sum of the four rates is the size of your sample. So to get the correlation coefficient, it's a self-calibrating experiment. This was gorgeous. And look at the result. The green curve is a prediction of quantum mechanics. It was calculated before we did the experiment. It takes into account the small inefficiency of the experiment. And the red blocks here are the result of the experiment, goes beautifully on the curve. And you see here are the zones of maximum violation of Bell's inequality, a violation by more than 40 standard deviation. 
There is absolutely no doubt, okay? Good. Now came the reason why I really embarked into this experiment with the blessing of John Bell. The idea, again, was to change the orientation of the polarizer while the photon were in flight. And the distance was of the order of 10 meters, which means that you must change the orientation in a few nanoseconds. And this is the kind of polarizer I had with a weight of 50 kilograms. You are not going to rotate 50 kilograms in a fraction of a microsecond or in a few nanoseconds. So what I decided is to use switches, an optical switch which can either send light towards this polarizer in orientation A or towards another polarizer in orientation A prime. Similar device on the other side, either B or B prime, and it's clear that this, if the switch is fast enough, is equivalent to a polarizer switch from A to A prime, going back to A, etc. How did I do the switch? I built it. You have water, you have PZT, and it's just a standing wave, an acoustic standing wave, and it relies on the acousto-optical effect. And the change, the switching, occurs every 10 nanoseconds, which is faster than what you need, so it's fine. But it was a difficult experiment for many reasons. First, these switches reduce the étendue of the beam, and which means that the signal to noise, the signal decreases, so you have to accumulate for several hours rather than several minutes. But at the end, we found a result. We found a violation of Bell's inequality by more than six standard deviation, which is convincing enough, okay? And in this experiment, for the first time, each measurement was separated from the other one by really a relativistic separation, a space-like separation. Einstein causality was enforced. I told you that now there are beautiful experiments done in what is called the third generation experiments. And the key of that is nonlinear optics by parametric down conversion, you can produce pairs of entangled photons in very narrow beams, so narrow that you can inject them, them into optical fibers. And with that, for instance, Nicolas Gizeng in Geneva has done a nice experiment in which he is allowed to use the network of Swiss Telecom at night. At night, Swiss people sleep, so he can use the, 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 the telephone, the commercial uh, network. And he has shown entanglement at a distance of 30 kilometers. In Innsbruck, 10 years ago, Zeilinger and Weiss did a nice experiment, also with optical fiber. And this experiment was really the ultimate experiment I was dreaming of doing. It was long enough that the choice of the orientation could be made locally by a random number generator and they found agreement with quantum mechanics. And it was the first time somebody was repeating our experiment of 82, and I must say that when the result came, I found kind of relieved. There have been many other tests of Bell's inequality. I don't want to go into the detail of this discussion about loophole, but let's say that there is a so-called sensitivity loophole, which is related to the fact that with detection of photon, the sensitivity is not 100%. And so some advocate of local hidden variable theory say, well, it would be better to have 100% efficiency. And this loophole has been closed by an experiment done by Dave Weinland and his group in Boulder, uh, working with ions. But in this experiment, they cannot separate the measurement in the sense of relativity. Anyway, we can conclude that Einstein's local realism is untenable. 